Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Mehta. I'm the CEO of a company called Mansueto Ventures. We publish Fast Company and Inc. magazines. And I'm delighted to moderate today's panel on preparing for the next pandemic. Uh, as you know, roughly one human pathogen emerges every year, and any one of those novel pathogens could have the potential to be the next pandemic. Today, we're going to explore the question of how the public and private sectors can work together to protect lives and livelihoods. There's already some interesting examples of public-private partnership just happening today. Um, Comic Relief US announced a $10 million pledge to the Global Fund, which is the first private organization to announce a commitment to the Global Fund's seventh replenishment. The World Economic Forum continues to support a number of global public-private partnerships, including the Pathogen Surveillance Initiatives. And there are so many other conversations happening here at the World Economic Forum that point to the importance of public-private partnerships. And we're going to explore a little bit of that on the panel today. Before I introduce our esteemed panelists, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we will have a little bit of time at the end for audience Q&A. So please use Slido, the Slido app, in order to submit your questions and I'll see them here on my iPad. And if you are going to use social media, if you're going to tweet or mention this panel, please include the hashtag WEF22. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. Helen E. Clark is board chair, maternal, partnership for maternal, newborn, and child health for the World Health Organization. And she's also the co-chair of the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and responsiveness. We also have with us, we're very fortunate to have President Paul Kagame, President of Rwanda, followed by Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as the author of a new book about preventing the next pandemic. We're followed by France D'Souza, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Illumina, Inc., and finally Peter Sands, who is the Executive Director of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I want to start with Bill Gates. Your new book is titled, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic. But this panel is about preparing for the next pandemic. So is the next pandemic really preventable? <laughs> well, the ideal is that when you have uh, outbreaks, that you detect them early and you contain them before they go global. Um, you know, less than 2% of the deaths are in the first 100 days. Um, and, you know, infectious disease is an exponential phenomena. And so if you let it run, uh, you know, then it's very difficult to rein it back in. The true exemplars, you know, the variance between the death rates in uh, countries with similar GDPs is quite dramatic. You have almost, you know, a factor of 50 between the good performers and the poor performers, where sadly the U.S. Uh, is in that poor performer uh, category. And there's clear things that they did. Uh, if those were done uh, early around the outbreak, then you could prevent it from spreading to lots and lots of countries. So that certainly should be the goal, is to not not let it glow, go global. And we'll explore some of those very specific things that countries and institutions can do to help prevent the next pandemic. Uh, President Kagami, let me ask you, what do you see as the top lessons that we've learned about preparing for the next pandemic from dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? To begin with, we have to act um... Uh, as if there is going to be a pandemic sooner or later anyway. So we, we get prepared for that, either to prevent it or stop it spreading, uh, as Bill has just said. But what we have learned, for example, from uh, the perspective of our continent, we have to deal with capacity issues to begin with. We have to have the capacity to test, to treat, to administer vaccines, and so on and so forth. That, that is number one. 
Number two, the lessons we learned also uh, show us that we have to avoid to always be dependent on others for things that uh, our lives depend on. Uh, so that's why uh, we seek to uh, build manufacturing capacities for vaccines, like uh, is beginning to happen in different uh, parts of our continent. Uh, the third would be, if you look at across the continent, we have to, again, work together. We have to put our resources. In which case, uh, continentally, we have um, the CDC, the African CDC. We also have the African Medicines Agency. And we have to build in their capacity to help all the countries of our uh, continent, 55 uh, countries. Um, the other, I would, should say, we need really to focus. There is uh, a lot in science and research and technology that uh, we should be able to tap into to deal with all these crises. So we should make investments either in individual countries or again, continentally, and that's what we have been doing and seeking to do. Okay. Helen, your independent panel released a report in May of this year, and the title was Transforming or Tinkering? Inaction Lays the Groundwork for Another Pandemic, which is very sobering <laughs> um, and very blunt. Can you talk a little bit about what is preventing private players and governments from taking the steps that you laid out in, in your initial reports? So in the initial report, we observed that there'd been previously around 16 different reports, reviews and commissions on this subject, most of which had never been acted on at all, which is part of the reason why we keep issuing progress and update reports to remind people that there is a good set of recommendations out there. But I think it, there's always a danger in this area that it, it falls victim to that cycle of panic and neglect. So we've had panic, right? But the reality is that political resolve to fight COVID is waning. Popular support for measures is, is waning. You know, people are over COVID. The problem is it's not done with us but we're in danger of losing this moment for transformative uh, change. And let's face it, people are still dying in significant numbers every, every day. People are still developing long COVID every day. Uh, Low-income countries uh, are horribly, horribly under-vaccinated. Under We've got issues here and now. I think another reason is that the package of things that has to happen is trans-sector, and there hasn't yet been a, an effort to try and bring together a, a head of state and government level focus on the range of things that needs to be done. We said this needs a special session at the General Assembly. It needs a negotiated political declaration that brings the different threads together. We're talking not just the WHO and health ecosystem. We're talking the WTOs. We're talking the IFIs. We're talking the wide range of foundations, players uh, in the space. And so a, a lot of people are doing bits and pieces, but it's not looking like a coordinated push to get transformational change. Yeah. And again, I really do want to come back to this idea of how we get that coordinated push. Um, but Peter, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the news that was made today. Um, you know, share a little bit about why it, why it was so significant. The, the $10 million itself is, is not the, the big number, although the Gates Foundation did, did more than match that number. But I also want you to talk a little bit about why it's important to address diseases like t malaria, TB, in the context of this conversation about preventing the next pandemic. Well, first of all, uh, we're really thrilled that Comic Relief US has announced this $10 million donation pledge to the Global Fund's Seventh Replenishment. Um, Comic Relief has been a long-standing partner of the Global Fund, so it's great to see them recommitting um, to the next phase of the Global Fund's work. And as you noted, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has kind of double-matched it 
bringing it up to 30 million. So thank you, um, Bill, for that. Um, and this is our first private sector pledge for this replenishment campaign. Now, 30 million is a great start. Um, the target is 18 billion, so we have a little ways, <laughs> um, uh, 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 a little ways to go. Uh, but it is incredibly important to have uh, significant private sector engagement in the way the Global Fund works, both from a financial perspective, because quite frankly, development assistance for health budgets aren't going to meet the total requirements of all the needs um, that we face right now. Um, but also because the private sector brings a set of capabilities. You know, we have partnerships with tech companies, with Coca-Cola on last mile distribution, all sorts of different partnerships. So it's not just the money, we like the money, but it's what comes with the money in terms of private sector skills and expertise. You asked about the link between uh, AIDS, TB and malaria, diseases like that, and pandemic preparedness. I think the starting point is that actually people don't really like thinking about pandemics. I mean, most of us want to wish COVID-19 over. Nobody's told the virus that, but the general attitude is that it's over. And what we've seen in the past is the public and political interest in investing against pandemics wanes really, really quickly. So if we want to sustain it, we have to do it in a way that actually delivers for people. And we can do that by investing smartly. And the way we do that is by investing in lab networks, community health workers, supply chains, primary healthcare facilities that simultaneously help countries defeat diseases like HIV, TB, and malaria and make us safer against future pathogens. And that isn't that hard to do. I mean, actually, many countries' responses to COVID-19 were based upon the infrastructure and capacities that had been put in place for HIV, TB, and malaria. I think we just have to be a bit more intentional in investing in multi-pathogen capability, in surge capacity, so that we do achieve those two objectives at once. Francis, can you talk a little bit about the role of innovation in helping us prepare or prevent the next pandemic? Sure. You know, we've recently just crossed over 15 million deaths associated with the pandemic, and that the extreme suffering of the pandemic has really challenge scientists and, and, and physicians and, and, and technologists to deliver innovation to combat the pandemic. And, and as we look back on this period, I think we will you know, we'll recognize just the amount of breakthrough innovation that has happened over the last couple of years on many fronts. On the sequencing front, for example, which is a technology that companies like Illumina provide, which you know we provide machines, you put in blood or saliva or, or plant material, we'll tell you the DNA in it. What's happened is over the last few years, the price of sequencing has dropped from $150,000 a genome in 2007 to $600 a genome today. So over a 99% drop in the price, and we've publicly committed to taking it down another 80% in the next few years. What that's enabled is us to deploy sequencing around the world. And we've started to see that pay off in a number of ways. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, we were in Wuhan. You know, the uh, first notification to the WHO was on December 31st, 2019. Ten days later, the viral genome was published. We were working in Shanghai on that. And then, you know, uh, Stefan at, Ancel at Moderna talks about the fact that they took that data, so they never had the live virus on their site. They used the genomic data coming off those machines to launch their vaccine development program. And then since then, we've seen sequencing now deployed around the world. Over 190 countries now have, uh, have sequenced a sequencing data on the virus in their countries. That's allowed us to watch and track how the virus is mutating, how it's, uh, how it's spreading, and that informs whether the tools we're using, like diagnostics or therapeutics or vaccines, are going to hold. And it also helps us make policy decisions around, well, should we do a travel ban because we haven't yet seen local spread, or is it too late to do that? Now, there's still more work to do. And while we have the components to prevent, the technology components to prevent a future pandemic, we we now have to do work on the policy. I'll give you an example. When South Africa and Botswana raised the alarm about a new variant that they'd noticed, the knee-jerk reaction from the United States and Europe was to immediately put a travel ban on them. So instead of rewarding them for identifying a new variant that, by the way, was already circulating in Europe, 
the reaction was to punish them. And so we need policies in place that say, look, if a, com if a country identifies a variant, we need to help them. We need to do a surge of vaccines or, or, or therapeutics or testing. We need to help them financially and make it safe for companies to, uh, countries to report that they see a, a, virus, a virus emerging. And then we also need to make this a global infrastructure. You know, we now know that ultimately we're only as strong as the weakest among us, and so we need a global surveillance infrastructure. I guess the good news is, as we're deploying this infrastructure around the world, it provides infrastructure not just to fight future pandemics, not just to fight future pathogen outbreaks, but also to help countries deal with other diseases, like cancer, for example. They can leverage the sequencing infrastructure or cardiovascular disease or genetic diseases. And so as we lay this out to fight the pandemic, we can emerge from this stronger, and we should make a commitment. You started with this. You know, we can't prevent future outbreaks, but we should commit to say this could be the last pandemic we see. Right. Let me follow up with, with Bill Gates on something that was really important about what Francis said, which was that you, know, you were in Wuhan, you were able to identify using next generation sequencing the risk, but that information was not disseminated as widely as it should have been. And there was you know, this, this degree of inaction. And before we even get to the policy piece, which is very important, I'd like to ask Bill Gates, since you cover this in your book, how do we come up with a coordinated effort? What is the path to creating some sort of global response so that we can help the weakest link get stronger? Well, there certainly was time enough for some countries to respond and have, you know, very, very mild mm -hmm. pandemics. Uh, ground zero, wherever the emergence takes place, is always going to have the toughest job. Um, you know, will they see an elevation in respiratory symptoms? Will they see an elevation in deaths? Um, will they run a diagnostic panel? They're not going to be sequencing everything. But when things, when you get an elevation or you get your normal diagnostic panel uh, showing something unusual, then you've got to start sequencing. And, you know, so... It could be, there could be more delay in reaction uh, if we have a country with low capacity and we don't have a global team. People always talk about, oh, let's help countries do better. Yeah, we should help countries do better. But a lot of the pandemic risks are in countries who in the next several decades will not have that local capacity. So you have to have global capacity. If you're serious about pandemics, you have to have global capacity that can come in and do those things, um, you know, so we see, we see that a lot. Um, but, you know, here we, you know, we're lucky if this had been 10 years ago, uh, some of these vaccine technologies did not exist. If it comes 10 years from now, we should have far, far better diagnostic technology. That is, be able to scale up every country within a month uh, to diagnose their entire population. We should have much better therapeutics, some of which will be pathogen independent. And then, you know, as we do come up with vaccines, we want vaccines that are infection blocking and long duration, which today, you know, the vaccines have saved millions of lives, but they don't have uh, much in the way of duration and they're not, they're not good at infection blocking. President Kagame, how how should health organizations and leaders sort of measure the humanitarian impact of pandemics and, and how should that factor into preparedness? Well, uh, first of all, government's responsibility being really working out these uh, policy measures and bringing in uh, they have to create the trust with the citizens. Uh, so, as I said earlier, building these capacities also uh, enables us to have a clear picture of what needs to be done in the country and where we need to put uh, the, the investments. And um, like in, in, in Rwanda and uh, Senegal, South Africa, uh, Ghana, we are beginning to work together and working with the partners from across the world. For example, the four I have mentioned, 
uh, are working now with BioNTech uh, to use uh, the mRNA technology to start actually building capacity on the ground to resolve the other problem I said uh, of always depending from how generous the rest of the world is going to be to us before we get the vaccines. So we have to work across the private sector, government, and then the citizens themselves. Like when this pandemic struck from the beginning, uh, and later on even when vaccines were discovered, we relied so much for a long time on what we had learned that science tells us to prevent by you know, the social distancing, and, uh, of course, the t testing, the hygiene, and all kinds of things. We, we, we relied so much on that, and it worked because we were able to communicate with the population and to mobilize them uh, to use what was known and what was available before the vaccines to make sure that the population remains uh, secure. So it, it's working across the board. It is being organized. It is. Uh, uh, building these capacities uh, even internally. Like the company I've just mentioned we are going to work with, they are going to uh, transfer knowledge to local engineers to do what they need to do in these countries, uh, South Africa, Senegal, Ghana, Rwanda, and others around the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Helen, what does a coordinated an ideal coordinated response looks like based on the work that you did on the independent panel and, and you know, the, the, the precedents that we've been talking about. If you could design the perfect coordinated response, what are the elements of it? Well, every orchestra needs a conductor. And so uh, our proposal was to have a, uh, a Global Health Threats Council, not a novel thought, by the way. President Kikwete of Tanzania chaired a panel back in Ban Ki-moon's time as Secretary General, which called for such a, a, a council, uh, emerging out of support from the, the General Assembly to oversee, if you like, uh, readiness across the, the system and hold actors to account, because there are many moving parts. As I said, what's going to happen with WTO and TRIPS? What's going to happen with this fund or that? What's going to happen uh, with you know, new legal instruments? And, and really to have some independent oversight of all of the institutions at a head of state and government level would be quite helpful in our opinion. And we would still like to see at the General Assembly this year a high-level event uh, where the heads of state, like President Kagame, would come, the negotiators would have prepared a declaration, sort of setting out the, the reform path across the sectors. We think that the, the General Assembly, which is attended at a very high level, uh, has the capacity to do that. But if I could just comment also on the humanitarian uh, aspects. You know, th this pandemic has had very uneven effects. It's been very hard on the elderly. It's been very uh, hard on those uh, with, with health vulnerabilities. It's been very hard on those who haven't been able to access any vaccines at all. And sometimes when you see reporting uh, on you know, who is dying in the course of the pandemic, it, it's almost airily dismissed as, oh, well, they were old or sick anyway. Hang on a minute. You know, I have a dad who's 100. I don't want him dying of COVID. He's not ready to go. And I think, you know, we really have to come back to our human values here. We have a responsibility to protect our populations. Uh, we have these huge health inequity issues of, of the undernourished, the immunocompromised, you know, all sorts of health inequalities. And we have left a lot of people very, very exposed, A, by you know, a range of suboptimal national responses, and then the, the inequality of, of vaccine and therapeutic rollouts. Um, Peter, in addition to um, funding partnerships, you've also struck some really interesting partnerships with corporations. For example, I think you've got to deal with, with Pfizer. Um, when it's not a financial contribution, but a contribution in kind or a letter of intent, you know, can you talk a little bit about how those kinds of public-private partnerships can work? Well, obviously, as uh, a big procurer of diagnostic, therapeutics, oxygen, all sorts of medical tools. We have a range of supply 
partnerships with um, different manufacturers. Uh, the one you reference um, on Friday, we announced a um, uh, letter of intent on, um, with Pfizer around the new oral antiviral. Uh, and we are working with partners through the ACT Accelerator um, to support countries in um, getting access to these oral antivirals, um, but equally as importantly in putting in place the testing strategies and clinical pathways to be able to use them. Because these oral antivirals have to be used pretty early in the first few days of people getting uh, COVID, and so you've got to have the testing, you've got to have the ability to decide which, which people it's appropriate for and get them onto treatment uh, uh, quickly. So um, there's a partnership with the manufacturer, but there's also a partnership with a whole bunch of um, uh, other actors to make this happen. And I do think uh, it's important that we, we do this because well, we would all like to believe that COVID-19 is going to sort of quietly march off into the sunset. I, I don't think it is. Um, we will see more variants. We don't know what those variants would be like. Um, but the advantage of having more tools at our disposal, and when I say our, at everybody's disposal, is that we can save a lot more lives. And I just want to pick up on the, um, the point that Helen made about the inequities. There's been a lot of focus on the inequities in provision of vaccines, of treatments. And it's absolutely right that we should focus on those and we should try and ensure equitable access as quickly as possible in this kind of situation. But we also, there's also a bit of an inequity that perhaps is less mentioned, which is who gets to decide what counts as a pandemic and when does it stop counting as a pandemic? Mm. So the last big pandemic to strike humanity was HIV AIDS. We don't tend to talk about it as a pandemic anymore. Um, the second biggest killer uh, among infectious diseases is tuberculosis. We don't tend to talk about it. And the reason we don't, I'm afraid, is because they don't pose a threat to people living in rich countries. And we need to be careful that we don't just put the special effort on those things that pose a threat to people in rich countries. And also that we don't end up with a trail of kind of residual pandemics where they're no longer threatening the people in the rich countries, but they're still killing a bunch of people in, in, in the poorer parts of the world. We need to kind of finish the job. Well, speaking of finishing the job, you know, several panelists have mentioned that we all wish COVID were no longer a topic and that we kind of wish that pandemics would just go away. Bill, you've just published an op-ed that reminds us that even as we are contending with a war in Ukraine, even as we are contending with the potential for a recession, even as we're contending with high inflation, you know, countries still need to, and leaders in private sector, still need to make pandemic preparedness or prevention a top priority. How, how, do, we, how do we do that when there are other concerns that keep creeping into the conversation? Well, we're certainly at risk that global health issues may get deprioritized as there's so much else going on, whether it's, you know, the ongoing pandemic or, as Peter says, you know, however you characterize HIV, malaria, and TB, uh, where, you know, the equity issue there is super dramatic. And it's good in a way that, you know, when infectious diseases hit rich countries, it reminds people wow, you know, we're not the only ones suffering from this. What about these great tools that we have access to? When the prevalence goes down in the rich countries, that awareness tends to diminish. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, various bilateral programs like US PEPFAR and the Multilateral Global Fund have done a good job reducing a lot of that inequity. But it'll be an interesting test. There's a replenishment that comes up uh, uh, probably in the, the last quarter, uh, where Global Fund's going to go out and ask for an increase from $14 billion to $18 billion. And we'll see in the face of all these priorities um, that are, I agree, absolutely important priorities, can global health maintain the visibility that it deserves? Um, you know, lots of work to do on this pandemic, lots of work to do on those three diseases, and lots of work to do on those health systems. Um, you know, that's the front line 
for all the things we're talking about. And those investments, you know, are very dramatic in terms of the payoffs you get, in terms of the human capacity you get uh, by getting rid of these disease burdens. Maybe I'll add one other dimension to this to this discussion because, you know, public health funding is going to be an important factor here in terms of combating the future pandemic. But one of the realizations I think that, that people have been coming to over the last couple of years is that combating pathogens is not just a public health priority. It's also a defense priority. Mm -hmm. And I remember I had this uh, conversation in, in the White House, actually, in, in March of 2020 when we were sitting around, and there was a realization that, you know, uh, we could have been under a bioterrorist attack and been under attack for weeks and, and many, many people were dying and we didn't know the source, we didn't know how to combat it. And so I think there's sort of an increasing awareness that you know, combating a pathogen is increasingly a defense priority too, that the next attack, yeah, it may be the next coronavirus or the next antimicrobial resistance, but it could be a bioterrorist weapon. And so what that brings into the equation is that we're not just necessarily looking for public health funding, which unfortunately goes through surges and then mm -hmm. dies off, but we should be accessing defense budgets too. And those, unfortunately, tend to be more perennial. But we've got to remember that, again, fighting pathogens is not just a public health priority. It's a global defense priority too, increasingly going forward. Yeah. Francis, at the top of the conversation, you talked about the massive scientific effort that went into creating the vaccines. And I, I, I have a tendency to make everything a talent conversation, so I apologize in advance, but are you seeing in, in biotech and in gene sequencing a, a, a renewed interest from young people who would otherwise have pursued careers at you know, a company like Microsoft, say, now turning their attention and energies to um, healthcare, um, vaccines, next generation sequencing? You know, that's a great question because, you know, as, as we think back on what this pandemic meant, I think there's a chance we think about the fact that this pandemic launched us into the 21st century in the same way that it was actually World War I, I believe, that launched us into the 20th century and set the defining issues of that century. And, and I think as we, we could be entering not just the 21st century, but this, the era of biology and the era of the genome. And, and, and I think that you know, as we start to think about some of the biggest challenges that we face, whether it's you know, food security or fighting pandemics or, um, you know, or climate change, increasingly biology is gonna play a bigger and bigger role. And if the 19th century was the era of the atom and the industrial revolution and the 20th century was the era of the bit and the digital revolution, you know, we'll increasingly start to think about the 21st century as being you know, an era of the genome and the, biology, the biological revolution. Now, what that means is, we need a lot of talent to come to biology. And we need a lot of talent from different fields. You know, with sequencing, we're digitizing biology, which means increasingly we need more people with deep software expertise, with deep AI and machine learning expertise. And, and, and we'll need that in, in a scale that we haven't seen before. And, and I'll give you an example. Even in the US, most doctors today went to med school before the first human genome was sequenced. And so if you go to a doctor, even where there are precision therapies available for things like cancer, many oncologists at the top of their field still don't go to sequencing yet. And so there's a need for education and sort of talent building across the entire spectrum, from continuing education you know, of, of doctors and specialists you know, through medical school, and I think that you know, Stanford and Harvard only started teaching genomics a few years ago, through uh, colleges, through, through high schools. And, and yes, we are seeing you know, people uh, that were traditionally in tech that have worked for the last decade in tech you know, coming to biology and, and inspired by the work that's happened over the pandemic, saying, look, I want to be part of, 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 of this in the future. But biology, that biology is the biology of longevity, cancer, you know, multi-million dollar stem cell therapies. It's not the biology of, of helping developing countries. The, you know, the percentage of the R&D budgets that go towards the things that cause the most deaths is well under 2%. So there's a little bit of a mismatch of what the excitement is, you know, N equals one type uh, yeah, and we need to change that. I mean, absolutely, the priority going forward has to be much more around the needs of the developing world. We cannot have this biology be, you know, a tool for the wealthy. And so we saw that in the pandemic, and we saw how we all have a vested interest in fighting this together. And then it doesn't matter if we fight it in, in the rich countries because it'll just keep mutating and coming back to attack us. Also, we're realizing that 
we need the diversity of genomes to really come up with the best therapeutics. And so, for example, today, the genome, uh, genomic data sets are woefully underrepresented in terms of African genomes and Asian genomes, and we realize that's creating, you know, poorer therapeutics, poorer diagnosis. So there's, I think, a, a need to make sure, as Bill said, that, you know, the way we spent our R&D in the past is not the same as we spend it in the future. We can't be creating these multi-hundred thousand dollar immunotherapies, you know, to fight cancer that'll never make it into the developing world. Right. Well, let me um, go back to you, Bill. You're an investor. You're somebody who cares deeply about innovation. How do we incent innovators to focus on biology for the underserved market? Well, it's a, you know, markets work for lots of things. But markets do not work to incent investment in malaria eradication or, uh, you know, TB vaccination. Those are incredibly expensive things that the affected countries, uh, you know, don't have the resources and there's no market for those things. So the term investor, if, if that means you're seeking profit, no, I'm not an investor. Uh, if it means trying to improve, you know, the, the 300,000 kids who die every year of malaria, then yes, the, met, the metric is always going to be uh, lives saved. And, you know, the greatest underinvestment is still in infectious disease. As we make progress there, we will want to move up and do non-infectious disease, non-communicable disease, NCDs is the term people use. And some of those, the, the therapies are getting cheap enough now that they really are suitable uh, for going global and making them available for everyone. But we still have a lot left to do on infectious disease and the generosity of rich world governments uh, is very important for that. For pandemics, it's different. They should fund those things even if they only care about their own lives. Uh, you know, a insurance policy that costs a few billion that fairly often will save you trillions of dollars is a very, very good deal. So we shouldn't take the budgets of the, you know, helping out developing countries and divert that mm -hmm. for pandemic. Pandemic money should come from health spending or just however you think of protecting your citizens while we continue a high level of, of generosity for the unique conditions in, in developing countries. Mm -hmm. Peter, you look like you want to get in here. Your body language is... <laughs> uh, I just wanted to agree with that point, which was that if um, better pandemic preparedness for the world as a whole is at the expense of the lives of the people in the poorest communities, that's not a great outcome. Uh, we need to achieve both. We need to do both simultaneously. But I also wanted to pick up on... Um, your reference to talent. I think one thing we have not done well in the global health community is come up with the equivalent of what the climate community did with green jobs, of making investment in the people who do things around climate adaptation mitigation into a positive. We tend to think of investments in health systems as being an expense. But actually, the investment in talent in community health workers, in lab technicians, in supply and logistics people, in doctors and nurses. These are, these are great jobs. These are sustained, skilled jobs providing people with career paths. They're also disproportionately jobs for women, particularly community health workers. And so as a way of promoting development as well as promoting better health, that it's a really powerful um, mechanism. But we, we haven't kind of sold it that way. I'm afraid too many finance ministers, I think, still think of more investment in the health system as being a sort of negative on the, um, the P&L of the country rather than being an investment in great jobs which are part of the future of the economy. I think on the, on the funding, it most definitely should not be coming from development assistance budgets. Heaven knows they're under incredible stress now. And we're seeing a number of the, you know, the good traditional donors diverting money from 
their budgets for refugee resettlement from Ukraine in their own countries and so on. So, to, as Peter says, to further rob the development assistance budget to pay for global public goods like pandemic preparedness and response would be uh, reprehensible. And so I guess a number of us are looking at uh, the way this financial intermediary fund that's uh, sort of coming out of the, the G20 type process, we're looking at it with a lot of interest because it looks again like another donor fund which will you know, come out of uh, assistance budgets. Our panel felt that you need a, a kind of global public investment model that, to cater for investment in global public goods because a weak link of the chain anywhere is a threat to the health security of all. So that, that's really a plea for different kinds of formulas and not drawing from the funds that should be going to the world's poorest. President Konami, I wanted to ask you a, a bit of a broader question about leadership. Um, what, kind, what leadership skills did you draw on the most in addressing the current pandemic? And are those the same leadership skills that world leaders, nonprofit leaders, business leaders are going to have to apply to pandemic preparedness? Yeah, let me, before I answer that, let me come to a point uh, adding to what uh, has just been said. Learning again from the experience we, we have had in Africa, in my country, because if you look at across Africa, only a, on average 18% of the populations have been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Now, th that, that's a, a small number. And the reason is that we did not invest enough in public health systems. Mm -hmm. Because even when people receive the vaccines, mm -hmm. they are not able to administer them. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually got spoiled in the uh, stores. So that speaks to the fact that there are certain investments we have to make, mm -hmm. even our national budgets we have to, I know our countries, developing countries have many priorities and um, uh, but health, building, investing in health and health systems must be one of those priorities. Mm. So that, that, that I wanted to mention that. Mm. So back to your point, the leadership qualities, I, I mean, some of these things. In our experience in my country, in Rwanda, we have been hard pressed to find solutions for many problems that have come almost at the same time. And uh, in fact, we've not been able sometimes to identify which is uh, mm. a priority and which one is not. So everything is a priority. Mm. So you, and, and you have to think about this, uh, as well as looking at the resources available, some many times limited, but the people that must be served must be part of that solution when you are thinking about the outcomes uh, and where you want to go. So the leadership that is therefore required is to understand the problem specifically, but how do you even you know, introduce the efficiency, that prioritization as to what needs to come to be in place first before you get to another, even in such a difficult situations, and being driven by the outcomes you want, but also being able to measure at every step, what are you doing? Does it need to change at a certain point? Do you need to do things differently and therefore, or continue the other one and do it better? So it's a broad question, but leadership has to be there. It has to be confronting the problem without excuses. Uh, so in, in some of us have learned this hard lesson uh, from dealing with these difficult uh, uh, problems of, of our society. And that is Rwanda, but it is similar to many other uh, parts of our continent. So, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is no finger pointing, there is no blame here. You just take it as your own and you know, bring together all the resources, the human, financial, others, and see what can do. And the best thing is that now the world has all kinds of tools that are the science, that are people who are going to help. And thanks, for example, the innovation of uh, 
the world putting the global fund, then uh, there are philanthropies who want to help, who are driven by you know, the outcomes that uh, we want. So it, it, it's an interplay of so many things. You know, Alden, there are a range of leadership styles shown uh, during the pandemic, and without doubt, I think the best uh, responses came from those leaders who followed the evidence and the science and didn't engender distrust and cynicism about it uh, among their publics. Secondly, on the basis of that, communicated clearly with their publics, including being honest about what we didn't know, because we didn't know much <laughs> at all uh, initially. Uh, and thirdly, had, had empathy, you know, that, that this was about people's lives and, and they were going to do whatever they could. And people, the, the leaders who put, you know, health and well-being first also tended to get the best economic responses. Because if you have a, a society that, are, that is fearful, that's not good for an economy either. If you have a society where people are, are falling sick unnecessarily because you haven't put in place the most basic public health measures, that's not good for the economy. So, uh, you know, there were good examples uh, across male and female leaders of, of these kinds of attributes. The women overall did pretty well. A lot of the men did well as well. But some, <laughs> some did very badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, you know, to repeat what you just said, Helen, you know, following the data, yeah. admitting what you don't know, and showing empathy just seem like good leadership skills, exactly. full stop. Exactly. Um, we do have time for a few questions from um, Slido, but before we go to that, um, you know, the word innovation has come up a number of times. Bill, you have a chapter in your book dedicated to, to innovation when it comes to preventing the next pandemic. What, what do you see as um, the you know, scientific, technological process innovations that need to happen as, as part of this broader conversation about pandemic preparedness? Well, it's fantastic that in the area of diagnostics, you know, we should be able to use uh, low-cost approaches that still report the data back uh, and ramp those up. Uh, there are new, a new generation of diagnostic machines like Lemira that can be used year in and year out for things like HIV and TB that then, you know, actually it got into Africa mostly because we had a COVID test authorized on it uh, and now we'll move to, uh, to use it for those other things. So diagnostic infrastructure backed up by uh, sequencing capacity, that's very, very important. Then in the therapeutic realm, you know, how do we get antivirals without waiting two years? How do we get antibodies that contract the variants very rapidly and don't require infusion? Uh, can we have drugs that are pathogen independent uh, and stimulate the innate immune system so you can block infection and those could be used early on? And then finally, the profile for the vaccines. Uh, duration and uh, infection blocking and breath being important there. You know, so that's probably tens of billions, um, but beneficial to so many diseases. Um, you know, mRNA has some great characteristics, so if we can add these other uh, features in, that, you know, it's a good chance that will be the solution for HIV and malaria. And, you know, we can probably move faster to develop those vaccines than using any other technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, besides this, the global monitoring piece, the next big piece is that R&D agenda. And then the hardest piece, which we've all been talking about, is the quality of the health systems mm -hmm. in the countries themselves. Yeah. There's a question from the audience about um, any comments on AI-driven infectious disease surveillance systems. Does anyone on the panel have a thought on and the use of artificial intelligence for surveillance? You can use AI for a number of different um, things. Um, you can use it to detect um, disease patterns that, that are out of the ordinary um, and, and, and get you a better radar screen um, on that. Um, we also see applications for AI in things like uh, TB case finding, um, where you're trying to use you're trying to improve the yield, essentially, because testing is expensive, um, um, so that you find the cases more effectively. So I think we will see a, a, a range of uses of AI, from disease surveillance to 
improving the efficacy of diagnostic efforts. Yeah, let me add one example that's playing out right now, which is, you know, ideally we'd get to a world where we're doing automatic monitoring of the environment. So you're seeing examples of wastewater monitoring, for example. Yeah. Say we'll do daily sequencing of samples, and but, but you want to add other forms of signal intelligence. Say we can do sequencing of communities through wastewater or, or other examples, but we're also going to look at Google searches. We're going to look at uh, the temperatures reported by networked thermometers, for example. And so integrating all this signal intelligence and trying to identify, well, what actually is indicative of an outbreak, that's stuff where you can use machine learning and AI to start to say what pattern, you know, starts to be most indicative of outbreaks. So that's one example that, that's playing out right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a question on Slido about the use and implementation of a global vaccine passport. Now, we're not talking about the past so much as the future, but does anybody on the panel have a thought about whether or not vaccine passports are valuable in, in the context of pandemic preparedness and prevention? I'm not sure necessarily about a passport, but I think what would be useful would be to have global standards of certification. Uh, you know, going back to the earlier times of vaccination in 2021, I was hearing from a, a friend who had family in Sweden who needed a particular vaccine to get there, a particular one to get to the US, a particular one was available somewhere else. You know, get, getting global standards established as to, as to what you know, qualifies as, as, as protection, I think, would be useful. So there's probably work to be done in this space. Yeah. yeah, it'd be more valuable if you had an infection blocking vaccine. I mean, the <laughs> idea of checking if people are vaccinated, mm. you know, if you have breakthrough infections, mm. What's the point? Uh, but the data system, some countries did a very good job on being able to verify vaccinated status. The US did not, but uh, you know, there's some great examples. Uh, even India did a, a fantastic job on that. Um, in, for our last question, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to make the optimistic case for preventing the next pandemic. If, if you had to say why the next pandemic would be prevented, what would, what would be the, the case for optimism? I'm gonna start with you, Helen. We have to believe that it's possible to stop a localized outbreak becoming a raging global pandemic. And that means better surveillance, more transparency, frankly, by all member states, if they think something's happened, it's got, to, it's got to be reported. And the WHO needs the power to be on the site with whatever teams need to be deployed. It needs to be able to publish the information it has rather than you know, beg countries for permission to do it. It's got to be able to take a precautionary approach in running up a flag. And it's got to be able to declare an emergency without being kneecapped by an emergency committee. These are basic things that need to be dealt with in a, in a review of the international health regulations. Otherwise, we will lose weeks again next time something happens. President Kagame, what makes you optimistic that we'll prevent the next pandemic? The, the fact that I think we have all learned one lesson or the other uh, as to the current pandemic and uh, a sense of urgency has kicked in and, and we know now which uh, uh, strings to pull and put things together and work together we might work together better uh, in the next pandemic than we have done. We have already done well to an extent working together. So I think lessons we have learned should be able to be uh, driving us in the right direction. Yeah, yeah it'd be reasonably rational to let, you know, tens of millions die and, you know, all the negative effects of the pandemic and not invest something uh, society does a great job on fire prevention. We have professional firefighters and we practice. Here, you know, the thing that I'd emphasize is practice. How do you quickly get diagnostic capacity up? How do you come up with quarantine policies and communicate them? And we just, you know, we're not ready. There's a strong correlation between the countries that had some risk of SARS-CoV-1 as being the best performers, and you know, you can directly map that to the quick action they took. So, between the room for innovation, uh, the scale of the tragedy, uh, I I think we will. We're a little distracted right now, so getting the debate going uh, is happening slowly. That's why this panel is so important. Uh, is 
because uh, it needs more discussion about exactly what form it takes. Uh, but, you know, I think this one is not super expensive uh, compared to the benefit. Yeah, yeah. But the reason I'm optimistic, I'd say, is that for the first time in human history, we have the technology components necessary to think about even preventing a pandemic. We have, you know, mRNA platforms, we have low-cost diagnostics, we have sequencing, all at price points that make it possible to think about preventing a pandemic. We've also learned not just the humanitarian cost of a pandemic, but the economic cost of a pandemic. So we've actually seen that bill, you know, come due, and I think that'll make us more likely to invest. And, and finally, we've realized that we're all in this together, that we have to help everyone else, because otherwise it just keeps coming back after us. And, and so I think all those lessons make me optimistic. Peter, I'm gonna give you the last word. <laughs> Hard to add, I, I do think that there have been some sea changes. As somebody who, uh, before I came to the Global Fund, was trying to persuade uh, businesses and the IMF to take pandemic threats seriously and was singularly unsuccessful. Um, uh, COVID did a much better job of that than I ever um, uh, did. So I think the point about the economics, look, we have some fantastic science um, and the more we can attract some of the best brains around the world to invest in this kind of stuff and spend their time on it, um, I think we'll bet better protection. The practice point, look, the sad truth is we have plenty of diseases to practice on. Mm -hmm. um, muscles used are far more effective than muscles left idle. And by turbocharging the fight against the infectious diseases that are killing people now, we can protect people far better from the infectious diseases that might kill all of us. Well, I'm glad we were able to end on an optimistic note. This has been a tremendous panel. I want to thank everybody, Helen, President Kagame, Bill Gates, Francis Souza, Peter Sam. Thank you all.